First, I'd like to thank um, Pan Atlantic for allowing me to give this presentation. I'd also like to thank the Pan Atlantic team for their contributions. It's been very helpful. But I'd also like to thank um, Scott Thornton for writing the abstract and providing me with a basic foundation <coughs> slide deck from which this talk was built upon. This talk wouldn't exist without that, so thank you, Scott. But just a little background on what I did. About a month ago, <coughs> maybe a few weeks, I started a page through the presentation and I noticed that a large number of figures were gravity related. Because of that, I had to brush myself back up on the gravity. Okay, so, and during that, what I did was I came across and we received some newer data. Uh, 2014, Sandwell uh, had published a geologic model. Uh, we used that as high resolution, it's very good, it's excellent. We've incorporated that into the talk. Also looked at some, since I did gravity, I might as well do some magnetic work. So I looked at Mouse 2009, he had a geologic model out, so we looked at that. And that sort of confirmed it, it sort of went with it, and it was also high resolution. So with both those two data sets, we were able to uh, <coughs> and improve our integration, we learned some new insights, and we were able to support what we were saying better. Because I noticed my, my attitude towards the potential fields goes back to 1980, and it stayed that way. However, just as seismic has progressed over the past 30 years, so it has potential fields. And it really opened my eyes on what it really shows in this paper that has done that for me. <coughs> now, we don't know all the answers, um, but no one does. Um, but of course, uh, we ended up with a better product, and we're moving ahead with that, and the work is ongoing. So I'd like to start with the first slide here. Agenda premise, fracture zones are believed to be a focus areas for hydrocarbon accumulations. Um, they're actually very, very important, as I'm just learning, and it's uh, very good. Well, I'll show you a couple examples from the Recon Calvo base in Brazil and the Kwanzaa base in Angola. We'll visit those two, and then we'll move up north to Equatorial Guinea, northern Gabon, where we, we have more data, more 3D data, and more well data, of course, and we, we can see how they control the structural orientations, sediment thickness, depositional systems, and their orientation, and salt movement. So it's basically like the whole world to me. And then, of course, we end up with conclusions. So this is the uh, central mid-Atlantic ridge, South America on the left, uh, West Africa on the right. We're going to visit Recon Cabo Basin. It's on the left. I don't think it's a point. It. You guys can see it there. And of course, we'll move over to Kwanzaa Basin. Do a little bit there, just a few slides, just to show what we see. And then move up to Gabon and Rio Muni Basin. And that's where we've done most of the work. That's where most of the meat is. And that's going to be in between the um, Romanche Fault and the Ascension Fault Zone. And we'll do that. <coughs> okay. Now, as I was looking through the data, um, all of you people know this, but I found that some there are different terms to describe a single item. So I thought I'd just do a little bit of nomenclature, fault basics. And this basically sets the tone for my talk here. Uh, basically, spreading center in red. Um, in between spreading centers in yellow is a transfer <coughs> fault where the rocks are moving in different opposite directions. And of course, fracture zone where the rocks are moving in the same direction. <coughs> um, these fault zones and boundaries here are easily picked up by gravity. And you'll see that in the data we have. It's fantastic. And, um, and also, near these transfer faults, release faults are generated. Normal faults down the basin, but they're deep and they're big, and they can produce many sub-basins, as we will see later. So these are also important in the, uh, in the work that I'm going to show you. They're important in uh, basically Brazil and in the Rio Muni Basin itself. <coughs> And I just did this one last night, just to um, show it. Uh, the, the oceanic crust is basically this, um, the faults are rooted in the oceanic crust as a single zone. As it comes up shallow, it spreads. And it can spread very, very wide. And so in our talk, sometimes I'm talking about the, for example, the ascension fault zone, but I may be off a little bit. It may be to the south or north of it because I'm off it, including in the spread here. Uh, very rarely, I do have a slide that shows this type of geology, and I do have a slide that shows the central zone where it's a main branch um, fault system. But basically, it starts down here, but we're working actually up in here, and we're doing our exploration effort. Today. So, 
reconcavo basin. What I'm showing here is map view, structural map with hydrocarbons. Uh, the Matu, the Matu Katu fault extends this way here to the northwest. That's the main fault I want to talk about, just a few sentences on it. Uh, it is a transformed fault. There are hydrocarbons associated with it. Uh, perpendicular from that are release faults. These release faults, I think, form many type basins where sediment can be thick and deposited in here. So when you have thick sediment along a major fault zone, you reactivate them, they form the perfect sink. Nice elements for hydrocarbon exploration. And the next image is a model based on the same basin. I want to cut the fault and its opening direction is here. You can more clearly see the release faults that are that are connected to the intersect the opening of the transfer fault and then some of the fields that I just draw in here to show you where they're located at. When you look at that, you will say the transfer faults uh, have a strong effect on hydrocarbon exploration uh, in this scenario. And of course, with additional faults here and here, we set up the, uh, the South Tacano Fault, Central Tacano Fault, and the North Tacano Fault uh, basin in, these, uh, in this whole basin overall. So it's broken up by the transfer faults. Um, now we're going to move to Angola, located over here on the map. And basically, one slide here. I've integrated both the gravity, the magnetic map, and the geologic map. Um, when you look at these uh, kinks here, these offsets in here and offsets here, we've been able to draw the transfer faults through this zone in here, and they do line up with recent discoveries such as the Lantra Fault, Mavinga, the Lantra Field, Mavinga Field, Camilla, and Bicular hydrocarbon accumulations. So again, we're seeing the same type of thing hydrocarbon accumulations along transfer fault zones. <clears throat> now we're moving up to Rio Muni Basin area. Um, this is really interesting. Um, starting at the south, I think I can move my mouse here. No, I can't. I'll use that. It's starting at the south, Ascension Fault Zone, um, going through our block K, uh, we have it, it aligns directly with the Seda Field and the Kumi Field in this end right in here. We have the Karibi Fault Zone, which aligns with the Karibi Field, which is located here. And we have a fault zone to the north, which aligns with the Allen and the Singh Fields up north here. So we're getting the same message um, from all three areas. So just, I'm gonna be revisiting the agenda just to keep you on track. Uh, now we're going to, we basically finished this, and I'm going to be going down to here where most of the presentation exists, and we're going to look at some structural orientation. The first map I want to show you is a free air gravity anomaly map. It's from Sandwell 2014. Uh, it's version number 23, if you're interested. Uh, here I have Ghana, the left, Niger Delta, Equatorial Guinea, and Gabon. I have the major transforms that I could see your romance here, and, and three fault zones here, sweeping up and going right into Equatorial Guinea, right into our focus area. And in our focus area, we have three blocks, block O2, block W, block K, which the 3D, actually you can see some interesting things with, with respect to fracture zones. And that's how I make the, the tie between the potential fields and the 3D seismic. And just for interest, uh, I noticed something interesting about the data because the next slide is going to show you the magnetic map. This is the gravity map, I'll show you the magnetic map. And I'm going to overlay them. And you'll see the difference in what they resolve. In the gravity map, you can actually see the fault zones 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I should have labeled them, but there's 6 here. And there's more, but these are the major ones. But what I want you to notice is that this one here, which is number 3 and number 5, uh, Look, look how the magnetic map images these fault zones here. And I'll show you the next slide. They don't. Basically, you see these parallel, uh, these could be basin, uh, abyssal hill fracture fabric, I think it's called abyssal hill fabric, uh, created by the opening. Uh, these rocks are magnetized in different ways, and there's a slight structure to them. And I think it gives it a slight texture. And you can see this texture continually up through this entire area, um, except for here and here. Why? Because I think the gravity, I think the magnetic 
data is consistent from here to here, and so it doesn't, simply doesn't pick it up. The gravity force will pick up your low density material very, very well. So now when you merge these two together, you get this. Um, the same faults, and here's the one that you didn't image before, but now I know there's one there. Okay, this one here is the uh, gravity. And um, again, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna use this as the backdrop of studying the seismic 3D in our focus area, which is um, in here. And, and of course, there's a, they pointed out to me, there's, a, there's, there's oil seep on the surface of St. Thomas or Sao Tome Field uh, Island, which is located here, which is also in line with the fracture zone, which is also very interesting. So what I'm gonna do next is, um, I believe, what I'm gonna do next is show you how we tie the seismic to this data. I'm gonna zoom in on the area. Okay, it's really hard to draw a square from this angle. Um, <laughs> zoom in on this area, and I'm gonna take the cube, which is this little rectangle, and I'm gonna plot it over the entire, entire screen so that you can see it. So, with, so I don't want you to confuse the 3D with the, with the, with the uh, gravity here. You have to relate it to what's in this context, which is located here. So the first one is block O2, and this is an Albion Afghan type structure map. It's fairly deep, and it has this grain northwest to southeast, continue on through here, and, and it's located here. Now, of course, when you blow it up, it has the same orientation as this one, but look how it, look how it looks similar to what we have here. Um, what does it mean? Um, is it really, are these features really these features? Uh, we don't know, we don't have any wells that go down this deep or in this block, but it looks very similar. And uh, my conclusion would be, my guess would be, uh, these features here may be, may be represented in 3D in this way. Now these linears are, have a normal offset down to the southwest, <coughs> however, uh, when you interpret them, they seem to have a little range component to it. And it's maybe these types of faults that may develop into uh, release faults in other areas up to where it's more intensely even structured. So the next 3D is located here, and we're going to show how the data, if you can see if I can line it up right, there's a lineament coming through, and it clips the northwest corner of this block. Okay, you see that right there? Okay. Uh, that's the next one. This 3D is actually a, um, well the surface is actually a detection that I made in Voxel Geo, this made it. Uh, I went down deep in the data, I rescaled the data so that's interpretable, and I made a detection. The detection goes through and picks all the high amplitudes it can. And this is below what some people call basements, below where you really can't see much at all. And when you look at the results, you'll see a lineament in line with transform faults, which would be through here, okay? And the same type of fabric coming through this way as we sue the basin up to the north. So things are consistent. The data looks uh, like we can, we can use it much more or better than we did with my 1980 uh, attitude about a gravity mag. Now I would say that we should be using this more often. It's fantastic. And because it's useful, if we can map these faults, we can do a lot more um, around this area, of course, here. The next slide is block K, which is located down here. <coughs> and I'll be showing that one next. Okay. Now block K was acquired early 2001. It was acquired for shallow geology, shallow anomalies, and so it wasn't really imaging the deep structure very well. Um, plus, in this area, there's some gravity sliding with salt, which is outlined here. So much of the fault, the ascension <coughs> fault, we think is covered. Okay. But because of that, well, we still believe it's here. This is work by Hector. He's sitting in the crowd here with us. Uh, I'm going to show you two lines, one more outboard and one more inboard to show you how the, how the ascension fault is more um, quiet and it get, becomes more active or more reactive as you go up to the northwest, northeast. And then I have a line up here that crosses this area here. This area here would actually cross the heart of the ascension fault. And I think it does because it's massively uh, structured, but I've got an interpretation on it to show it to you. So first we'll show you this, this point, and we draw a line, and then basically we're tracing the ascension fault through block K. Yeah. So there we go. Um, this is the outboard uh, well, uh, 
line. And if you look at it, it shows some structuring is minor, uh, some deep structuring are down in here. Um, these two points are just reference points for the next slide. Um, you see a small little fault coming up through here, a little deformation. And um, the next slide, of course, is where we structure that. It's even structuring to this very day by the expression on the seafloor. Um, and of course, we have more intense structuring, more activation, more reactivation of the ascension fault. That fault is coming up through here and here. Okay. Now, this, this strata here is actually uh, complicated. It's mixed with uh, a gravity slide with it, but overall, I think that's the interpretation. Now, as we go up north a little bit, uh, from here to here, we'll look at another fault zone where this ascension fault becomes, um, I think, full blown in its uh, glory. So, this fault cuts across <coughs> through here, and this is the line drawing of it. I couldn't show the line, but I can show the line drawing. And I did this actually about a year ago, so I didn't really know what I had. Um, but it's a large, major wrench fault, a structure. It's faulted, highly, <coughs> highly faulted, and it's uplifted. All this sediment up in here is being eroded and down, down it goes down the basin. Okay, down it goes. Down the cobrades and so on. So it's a tense structuring, and this structuring occurs all throughout here. It starts here, and it's all throughout here that we can see on the data. When you have this type of structuring, of course, the sediment eroded from it is going to form canyons and deposit it in the basin to the northwest. So these, these, these fault zones are actually doing all this. And it's amazing what they're, how everything's tied together. And we will see some fans and some uh, data a little later on. That's because I forgot what the next slide's going to be. <laughs> OK, this one. This is a. Um, <coughs> A line cutting through the data like this, and it will enter the distal part of the basin toward the more proximal, proximal near towards onshore, near towards more where there's structuring. And as you as you are far away from it, there is a you can I know you can't read this, but there is a fault called the Caribbean fault, which is not quite activated, and that's located here, still buried. It may some still have a small small little fault stringers coming up but it's basically inactive. As you go towards the shoreline, you will basically intersect you know, this area here, where it's highly structured. And of course, the, the ascension is, is highly structured here. And that's what it shows. Basically showing it controls the basin development, controls basin deposition. You have a high here. It's active quite shallow, depositing data, depositing sands and sediment into the basin, turbidites, sands, and so on. Um, the next slide is even more interesting because the next slide is going to go from here and cut, cut around through here. And we'll be intersecting the Caribbean Fault again. But we'll be in this, intersecting the Caribbean Fault up dip. And up dip is where it becomes more active and more structured. So here we go. So in this case, we have the Cameroon fracture <coughs> zone corresponds to the Cameroon Volcanic Ridge. And over to this side, which is down over here on the right, which is this, is a Caribbean fracture zone. Highly structured, uh, creating lots of structures, and it's quite active up to the top of my scene. You can see the change in thicknesses as we go through here, generating a pile of thickness. These, these transfer salts are controlling thickness and, of course, deposition. And that's what I'm showing here. There's a whole list of fields across the top which bring this, the basin along this northern edge right, up in, right in through here. Right. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. Now next, we're going to go to the sediment thickness and deposition of systems orientation slides. We'll cover those right now. Um, this is a cross section north south through the basin. Um, here, north Gabon cutting through block O2 and then squirrel its way down to block K, which is K2. Uh, we have the tertiary section, top of Miocene, uh, shown here. And you can see that at the breaks, which are the fault zones, there's sudden change of thicknesses. And this is going to, when we flatten it, you can see it much better. You can see that there's changes in thickness across the fracture zones. Um, this is what we saw, I think what I saw, at the Recon Cabo Basin, where <coughs> these faults are setting up different sub-basins uh, in the region. So these um, fracture zones control thicknesses. Uh, based on this data here. 
This is a deposition environment map, the fairway, fairway map, and we have, a, we have a whole series of them, but I'm just showing you one. Um, we have the ascension fault coming through here, and when it comes through here, you'll see here we have data, rocks are absent. We have um, eroded, it's eroded up in here. See that, eroded, rocks are absent? That's because it's all uplifted, and of course, with that uplift, due to the transform fault coming through, it dumps all this, most of the sediment down basin work. Now it's not all sands, there's a whole mixture of lithologies. We still have to do our homework as far as um, looking at these turbidite systems, but at least we know where they are and how they trimmed. <clears throat> this is a visualization, let me go back up one. Um, the next picture is, is from the northwest looking to the southwest. So I'm just gonna <coughs> grab one of these, it's like one of these, but it could, it could be more. You're looking from here to here, so you'll see like a basin plane. We can call it the ascension plane or something, but something where it's, uh, it's flat. Uh, the combination space is made available through the ascension fault. Through the ascension fault, and then you'll see the uplifted area. That's pretty ugly; it gets all busted up, and you'll see that difference in this next slide. And that's what this is. This is actually block K. The ascension fault is coming through, or one limb of it is coming through. Um, here you have the uplift, erosion, and we also have some gravity slides coming down. They're not shown on this map, um, which covers this, basically this entire area over here. But you do have a whole series of stacked turbidites going from the Turonian to the uh, Paleocene in this region here. Um, so that's a real example of one of those um, lobes. Next. Salt movement is also very interesting. We'll cover that next. The salt clay in this area is quite extensive, going from all the way down from the um, Ruby Kungo field all the way up and all, even slightly beyond it. I think of the Caribbean fault is up here. I think it tags this slightly up here. Uh, here we're just showing you the uh, diapirs. There's also the salt pillows. There's also a Loch Ness salt that's not shown here. And when you add them all together, I think you make a boundary that covers half the block K and some more of the outboard area here. So it's quite extensive and quite large. And then you need to imagine the ascension fault, the transforms coming through and intersecting these, just basically this area here. And here's just a slide to show you the styles. Uh, we have diapirs, of course, pillows, and the Lucknow salt. I'll be spending a few more slides in here because we have 3D data there, we have more data, I can talk about it <coughs> and show you what we see there and how it sets up leads and so on. But of course, we have one of the ascension fault coming up and the gravity sliding going down. And on top of that gravity sliding, sometimes you see a perched pond going with it and then it's draped, so it gets pretty interesting, like the Sable Field, I think, is made that way. So here's the model. <coughs> by RPS, uh, you have uh, basically a transpressional anticline. These anticlines are visible, barely visible in the block case seismic. We have to do a lot of imaging to see it because it's gone so deep. That's because it's shallow, it's been, it's been shot for shallow geology. But we can see rollovers down in here <coughs> and where it is uplifted, uh, we have detachments and on those detachments there could be ponds and so on. So we have leads up here developing we have leads below it, and, um, and we'll show you what they look like. I think this is a very good example of how the transform controls salt movement. It picks it up and allows it to slide <coughs> down. <clears throat> Say the field, uh, a lot of you know about this, but it just shows a complete line uh, of the, of the, the culmet. Uh, you'll see there's rafting, there's toe thrust, there's diapirism going on in here. Um, and even some erosion at the top. But this is the kind of structures that are created when, they, when the gravity slide comes down. And I do I count that for this agent, uh, the ascension uplift, which is located right in through here. But then you have other uplifts here and other uplifts here. So this is sort of like repeated, but maybe not the gravity slides, but the uplifts are, and the, and the deposition towards the basin is. This is one of our own blocks and blocks, our own prospects in block K. Uh, we have Turonian and Afton um, sediment down in here. Um, we have the ascension uplift, and here's, here's half of the uh, 
global structure down in here. And of course, this is uplifted, it's thinner. We have a, it's sliding down. You can see the thickness changes of it. We also have a lead up in here. And so it produces uh, shallower prospects, deeper prospects. And we have a, I think we can explain in general how they get there. Uh, in summary, this went pretty quick. In summary, um, I put this together because I wanted to summarize what I've learned and how it actually works, but in a very simple way. Here you have your transfer systems, your, your spreading centers, your fault zones, and, and, and then you um, basically add the structure. I could have drawn just a big anticline here, and I should have done that, just an anticline symbol, but a, a structure develops it's complicated because you have different regions where the structure is more intense than others, where the fault is more offset than others, but it's a complex zone of structures. When you have this, due to the transfer of fault, it generates um, down dip turbidite fans, slope fans, uh, along this whole entire trend. And, um, and of course, there's salt sitting on top of it. And I put a little fondant basin here. And with further uplift, the salt then begins to move over and on top of the buried uh, deposition, the buried turbidites located here and here and here. So that's basically what we're trying to, what we're seeing um, in a simple way. Uh, the key learnings are fault zones, to me, are, are very, very important. I, I never knew this before, this, this talk. Um, thanks to Scott. Uh, they, they do control a lot of geology, a lot of deposition, sediment thickness, structure, deposition of the system, salt movement, and they have a real big role in this, in this type of geology. Uh, significant oil fields and discoveries are in close proximity to fracture zones. We've shown that in the three or four basins. Uh, reactivation of these faults at various times have affected all the above, which makes it more interesting, more perspective, more fun to explore. And of course, investigating these fracture zones can be a predictive tool in our exploration efforts. Um, and in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge some members of the Panhellenic team, Hector Castillo, Steve Leslie, who provided me with the gravity mag maps, uh, Grant Crandall, some regional geology in Block 02 area, Francis, geology of the whole area, Brad Brondollar, good, orga good organizer, and help me keep me straight on the, what I'm saying, and of course, Ian Davidson. And thanks to IMG Event Ventures for permission to use span lines for the Bona and Angola. Uh, thank you very much. And that's it. You want to take some questions, Gerald? No, but I'll take them. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yeah, all the answers are here. Basically, you need one major fault zone. The fault zones are actually quite wide. When you look at that 3D tunnel we made, um, you can see one break, but when we look at the sub on zone on seismic, it could be 10 kilometers or maybe several kilometers wide. And that's enough to do a lot of, uh, produce a lot of good results. Most of the uh, results we see, of course, are important exploration elements. And uh, to me, it takes one fault zone. Now, okay, a little more. The fault zone could actually splay into different faults. So that would be even more benefit. So the question, uh, it depends on the geology. Uh, one fault zone would do, but I think multiple fault zones would be even better as far as generating the structures, deposition, and heating up the area and allowing the migration to come up and so on through the traps, which is all. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah, uh, Gerald, great talk. Uh, thanks very much. I enjoyed it a lot. The, um, it, the transfer zones or the fracture zones, <coughs> obviously lock up at something, they form early, but then they, they lock up. But along this margin, they seem to be re reactivated fairly recently. Can you speak to what may be causing the reactivation, uh, especially where they meet the, uh, the continent ocean boundary? The impression I get is that the fault zones are, um, are merging, and they're starting to turn a little bit to the north, um, slightly. Okay. Now, it could be, I don't think it's global because it's on this arc and you're trying to draw a straight line. I think they're actually rotating. If I can pull up a slide, uh, I can't explain, but I think they're very interesting. If you look um, down in here, 
you have this parallel type uh, nature to it. And over here, it's not. It almost looks like it's drag, you know, but I don't think it's drag. Uh, but something's, there's a major tectonic happening through here. It almost looks like a traffic jam where it's all coming together. And that may give enough tectonic forces to reactivate many of the faults, because these are highly intense faults in here, highly reactivated. And um, <clears throat> when you look at the, uh, when you look at uh, the, some of the, the fault where I had the line drawn, right on top of the fault zone, but no trap. So we still got to do that. We still got to demonstrate our the fault seal and reservoir story, always. But this simply points you to an area that may have more potential of finding something um, than others. Yeah. For example, um, I was asking myself the question, uh, this the one with the fields on it. Yeah, here. Uh, why is that field here? And why, why not here? Or why, you know, why is it there? Why is it there? Why is it um, it's really, really sculpted very strongly, so I, I, I wouldn't have any trouble with saying that's enough to reactivate it. Um, yeah. I think I answered the question. The same way. Yes, sir. Uh, do, do all, in, in these highly fractured zones, do you ever have a problem with seal, or do they all trap? We all have our own, we all have to do that work. <laughs> <laughs> we got to check seal. Some of the fields here are dry because there's no trap. They're right Okay, uh, thank you very much, Carol, and for a brilliant talk and the entire Pan Atlantic team. Now, I know Gerald really likes rocks. <laughs> this, uh, it's a thank you item here, it's your name on it. And petrified wood from Miocene Fleming Formation uh, gives the genus, it's a modern species of, uh, of uh, which lives in East Texas, is dogwood. Yeah. And the black holes are where it started to rot before it was mineralized. So thank you very much for an excellent talk, Carol. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you in January for uh, Juan Flinch's talk, comparing the uh, deep water Mexican Gulf of Mexico with western Morocco. Drive right, carefully and have a nice uh, holidays. <laughs>